Morning. Morning. Good morning, this side. Morning. Oh, that's very low. Hmm, that's better when you're doing for Delroy. Good morning, this side. Morning. Good morning, this side. Morning. Don't worry, we are not live yet. I'm just trying to wake you up. Morning, church. Morning. It's good to be here, isn't it? And uh, wow, doesn't the sun make it different? Amen. Yeah. Amen. And uh, Lord, thank you for the sun today. And uh, what a beautiful day it is. You know, I, I, we're here to worship God this morning. Yeah. We we're here to give praise and honor to His name, to magnify Him. To raise him up in this place. To give him the rightful place. Not only in this place, but in our lives. Amen. And the word of God says this in the book of Lamentations. Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 22. It says, The Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases. For his compassion never fails. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I have hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. But just those two little thoughts there. They are new every morning. God has got something new for us this morning. Do you believe that? Yes. Today is a new day. Today is a different day. Today is the opportunity for God to do something miraculous in your life. <laughs> He's got something new. And then it says this, The Lord is my portion, says my soul. I wonder this morning if your soul says that this morning, that the Lord is my portion. Amen. That above anything else this morning, you want to meet with God. Again. You want to meet with him in this meeting. You know, when Jesus ascended on high, he said, I'd send another, the Holy Spirit, to be with you. And God says that where two or three are gathered, there he is in the very midst of them. And so God is here this morning, and I just want us to stand, if you don't mind, and just, just become aware of the very fact that we are not just here meeting together, but we have come to meet with God this morning. And I just wonder if you, if you feel comfortable just to reach out and to say, Lord, I want to hear from you today. Lord, I want to worship you in spirit and in truth. I want to lift your name up, Lord God. Lord, I want to lay down those things that would trouble me, and I want to bring them to you right at the beginning of this meeting. Lord, because you said, cast all your cares upon you because you care for us. Lord, I'm just going to, I'm just going to do that right now in, in line with your word. I'm going to cast them to you, Lord, and say, Lord, I can't carry them, but you can. Lord, I am going to worship you this day. I am going to exalt you. I will lift up your name in this place above any other name, above any other situation in my life. This morning, I will lift up the name of Jesus over it and proclaim the victory in Christ. Hallelujah, because he has won the victory for each and every one of us. So, Lord, we exalt you. We magnify you. We lift up your name in this place. And if you are online at home, welcome. But know this, that God is with you, and God is for you. Let's exalt his name together, shall we, this morning. Let's worship him in song and praise this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, guys. Bless you.
And all your our presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away. Oh, Santa. Oh, Santa. You are the God who brings us. You're worthy of all our praises. Welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Hosanna, you are the God who saves us. You're worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna, come up your way. Welcome you here, Lord Jesus. And hear the sound of hearts returning. Oh, we tend to you. Come on, church. Yeah. And in your kingdom, broken. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. Oh, yeah. Because in your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away. Come on, check. Oh, Santa. Oh, Santa. See when the God is raised us. Oh, when the above. Yeah, come on. Hosanna, Hosanna. You are the God of us. Oh, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Hosanna, Hosanna. You are the God who saves us. Oh, welcome you here. you here, Lord Jesus. We welcome you here, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Now, you know me by now, don't you? Well, most of you do. If, you knew, if you're here for the first time, then maybe you don't know me. My name is Dave. I'm the pastor, the minister here. And if you're here for the first time, welcome. And thank you for being here. We trust you'll feel at home and relaxed. And, uh, and we're a family here. And if you look around the congregation, you'll see many different faces from many different nations. And uh, we want to tell you this morning, if you're here for the first time, that God loves you. Amen. Amen. God loves you. And we love you. We love you. We is, we're his children. And uh, I want us to sing this again. I, I just... Ah. Do you know, when Jesus came in the week before he was crucified into Jerusalem, the people began to get excited because he was coming. The Messiah was coming. Mm. And they began to sing Hosanna, which, 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 you know, they began to cry out and say, Son of David, save us. 
and Hosanna to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords. And they got excited. And then I thought about my namesake, David. And when David was bringing the, heart, the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, he, he, he got told off because, by his wife because he got a bit too excited about praising God. I don't think you can ever get too excited about praising God. Do you know what I mean? Thankfully, my wife has never told me off for getting too excited about praising God. <laughs> she might have told me off for one or two other things, and, uh, but uh, never for praising God. And so this morning, why don't we just let loose? Don't worry about the person next to you. And David didn't worry about his wife, right? Okay. He worried about God. And God is worthy of our praise. Amen? Amen. Yeah? Hear the sound of hearts. Well, praise is rising. Come on, let's start there. Come on. Thanks, guys. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory be to God. I just want you to take your seats for a minute. We're going we're gonna to worship again in a minute, but I just, I just really feel we, we need to do this right at this moment. So, Sharon, come up, my up, please. And uh, where's Chrissy? 
Come on. And uh... um, well, first of all, Christine wants to bravely share something that has been happening to her. Um, Christine helps us at Warm Welcome, and um, we we met her right at the very beginning. Didn't we? You were one of the first people that came through that door to see what we were doing. Oh, go on then and say. And... A year ago, I was diagnosed with lung cancer. I've had the chemo, I've been radiotherapy. 30% of the cancer has now gone. But <laughs> I love coming here on a Wednesday to help out. Thanks to Sharon. Thanks to Mel, thanks to Pastor Dave, and thanks to you, Sharon, for picking me up, always taking me home. You've all made me feel so welcome and supported me through the cancer. But, and also, thank you to God for every day I've got left in my life. I'm so grateful to him. Oh, bless you. Well done. Oh, praise God. And, you know, Christine said she was so thankful for all the prayers because it helped you, didn't it, on this journey. And obviously it's not, not finished, but God is with you. And you know how much we love you. And I think, can, can we pray for Christine? Let's pray for her. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Father God, we give you thanks. We thank you for bringing Christine into our lives. And we thank you, Lord, that you made a way. You, you opened the doors to, to this building. And Christine found a way to come in. Lord, you are the God who, who loves us, who welcomes us, whose arms are open wide. And you drew Christine by your love. And Lord, I thank you. I thank you that we've had the privilege of journeying with her. Thank you, Lord, for the prayers that have been offered for this lady's life, this battle she's been in. Thank you for what you've done in her body, reducing the cancer. And Lord, we know that you've started a good thing in Christine and that you will complete it. Lord, we pray for complete healing of this cancer to be gone in the name of Jesus, Amen. to be removed. Lord, we pray that you will draw her closer to you. Lord, she knows you. She knows that you love her. And Lord, I pray that she is your child. That Lord, that she knows that she can come to you and that you are always with her and that you'll never leave her. Lord, thank you for what you started all these years ago, Lord, and that you have brought all the people into into our lives, into, into your presence. Because, Lord, when we open those doors every Wednesday, you are with us. Lord, you are, you are there. Lord, and we thank you. We thank you just as you're here now with us today. Lord, you are in this place. So, Lord, we give you all the glory and all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Christine, for sharing. And, you know, as, as Christine said I don't know if you heard with a, with a laugh <laughs> she seen the doors were open and she came in to go to the toilet <laughs> and um, la last week as, as Pastor Dave was saying we had some people come and they were asking us stories they were asking Christine and, and me and, and one of uh, and, and this young man over here at the front <laughs> they were asking us what difference it made what impact and you know we all have a story to tell and and it just reminded me that years, a few years ago, just before COVID, we had a prayer meeting here and Pastor Dave said, what do you see in the community? Where do you see God? And um, after that prayer meeting, I sat in the car and I was crying because I'd seen the brokenness around and, you know, this, this area, there's a lot um, uh, of, of poverty, there's a, a lot of Unemployment mixed in with all the, the good things that you know are happening with the businesses and things like that. But I just seen 
the, I don't know, I didn't understand it. I seen uh, the cross with a heart. I seen a lot of people coming, a lot of people coming. And they were coming here to receive the love of God. They were coming here to receive uh, and to see him. And they were also practically going to all the places for help. And, and we're starting to see that happen. And I just thank God for what he put on my heart, what he showed me that through the leadership here, Pastor Dave, through the congregation here, the support has been immense. It's just, you know, the table is brimming with food. You know, every month you faithfully give either food or, you know, money that, or the team. I mean, if you help on a Wednesday, could you just give me a wave, please? Just give me a wave. Look at that. It's amazing. All these wonderful people. And God's done that. Yeah, give God the glory because he's brought everybody. You know, and we, we meet new people every week. And I, like I say, I am just so thankful. We had a, a donation. I always tired on a Wednesday. <laughs> get home and you know Richard come home and he had three boxes full of baby clothes little cardigans um, blankets, booties, that sort of thing and they're beautiful and it was a minister that a retired minister, his wife had donated those that she'd been knitting and you know the congreg well some of the people his family, this minister's family this retired um, Church of England minister and they had given just over £100 to the pantry for us to get food. And again, just over £100 for the meals, because we serve meals on a Wednesday. And that's free for the community to come in for breakfast and for lunch. And it's just been a privilege to see you know, people's hearts touched to give. And yeah, I'm just very thankful and just praise God, I do, for everything he's done. And thank you all. Thank you so much. You know, um, I hope Chrissy didn't mind me saying this, but uh, last year when she found she, uh, she got cancer and, uh, you know, they told her it wasn't very good, etc. We sat right on the back two seats on a Wednesday. And Chrissy said, can I, uh, can I have a chat to you, Pastor? I says, yeah. And she says, uh, can I ask you, will you do my funeral? Right? And uh, I says, wow, Chrissy. I says, of course I'll do your funeral. Didn't you? Okay. And um, she says, how much will it cost me? I says, well, it'll cost you nothing here. Um, I says, but I want to say this, and I said it to you on Wednesday, I do not want to be the person that does your funeral, okay? Because I want you to be around for another 20 years, okay? And, uh, and I am believing, I am believing and trusting what God started in your life, he'll finish, amen? amen. And uh, Chrissy, bless you, and I know how hard that has been for you this morning, but you just wanted to come and give thanks, didn't you? You know, and, uh, and how wonderful is that, you know. And we are going to continue to pray as a fellowship for you. Uh, and, and believe that, that uh, God's going to do a miracle in your life. Amen. Uh, isn't that great? What a wonderful testimony. Come on, let's just. <laughs> let's stand together. Let's, let's continue to worship God in song this morning. Hallelujah. Praise God. Before we sing this song, just change the, the order of the song because of Pastor Dave, but that's fine. Um, you wonder, after what you're going through, where do you get the strength from? What makes you rejoice through all you go through? When you look on the TV, is there anything to rejoice about, really? No. Look at your health. Is there anything to rejoice about, really? It's always failing. But there is one thing. There is one person where we get our strength from. Jesus Christ. 
No one can cheer your heart like Jesus. And I want us to sing this hymn slowly as a heart, just a thanksgiving and prayer to God. Acknowledging what he does in your life. For those who lost their loved one during this week, like Sister Mado, where can you get your strength from except from Jesus? Let's sing this hymn.
only in you, Lord, that we find our strength.
Alléluia. Everything else will fade away. Everything else will pass away. Lord, this world will end. Our health will fail. Lord, by your name, the hope we have in you, Lord. We give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise, Lord. There is no one else like you, Lord. There is no one else like you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to your holy name. Shout to the Lord. Glory to your holy name. Shout to the Lord. Shout to the Lord. Come on, shout to the Lord. Come on, lift up your voice this morning. Shout to the Lord. He's a great, great father. Hallelujah. He's our savior. He's our healer. He's our deliverer. Hallelujah. He is creator, God. Hallelujah. The one who was, the one who is, the one who is to come. We exalt you and magnify your name this morning. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. to sing that chorus bit again okay and I want, you, I want you to hear what's just been said because God wants to pour out compassion and love his grace his mercy 
into your lives, into our lives. Amen? And maybe you're here for the first time and this meeting's a little strange to you. But you see, we believe that God has called us into relationship with him. And if you have a relationship with someone, it's real. <laughs> and we have a real relationship with our living God. And our God wants to touch us and minister to us this morning. Jesus, Lamb of God. Come on, just open yourself up to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank that you are here this morning. You present yourself with us by your Holy Spirit. In us. Lord, your word says, if we've been born again, that you come and dwell in us. That we are the temple of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. But Lord, equally, you corporately come. Lord, where your family is gathered. Lord, to minister into individuals' lives, Lord God. People that are going through stuff. People that are facing situations and circumstances. You are our hope. You are our hope. Not only are you our hope, but you are our deliverer. Praise God. Hallelujah. Please take your seats. I just want to give some notices before the children go out this morning. And uh, just to say that we've got Tots Cafe tomorrow morning. If you are, uh, if, if you've got a tot and you don't know where to be tomorrow, <laughs> tot being a little one, you know what I mean? Not to four, before they get to school or pre, pre, preschool or whatever it is nowadays. Come along, 10 to 4. You'll have a great time. And... Uh, You'll just have a, a good time and uh, get some uh, toast and cakes and tea and coffee and you can have a natter. Sorry? 10 till 12. What did it say? Did I? You want me here then, will you? No. 10 till 12. <laughs> I'm running ahead of myself. Okay. Uh, Tuesday, we have... Um, we have... Renew 91, which is a cafe that is designed and set up for people just to come and relax in a space, maybe dealing with mental health issues or, or whatever uh, in their lives. It's a space just to come and equally just receive some prayer if people want to receive some prayer uh, or just maybe contact with other people that are going through similar things. Uh, and that is uh, from 2 till 4 on Tuesday. And, uh, you know, increasingly we see more and more people come. So let me say, you know, if you know anybody that is struggling, tell them we've got this space. Okay, and they'll be made welcome. And, uh, and just a place to not be challenged, but just a place to explore. Uh, and just a place to feel relaxed in the presence of God. Uh, there's no Bible study on Tuesday night. On Wednesday, we have our food bank. And as Sharon said, thank you for everybody that faithfully gives month after month and, uh, and into the food bank. You're, you're doing an awesome work. Okay. 
And you're allowing us to, to be those hands that, that give out. But you're doing, uh, you're doing an awesome work in this ministry. So thank you for that. So we've got our food bank from 10 to 12. We've got our lunch from 12 till 1 now. And, um, and then we've got our friendship group from 2 till 4 on a Wednesday. Let me encourage you to come on. They're great to see how many folks stayed around for the friendship group on Wednesday. And uh, it was lovely. Um, Thursday we have got uh, annual uh, prayer and fasting week as, as we come together just to seek God for breakthrough in different situations let me encourage you to just seek God this week just spend some time fasting and, uh, and making some space to be with God and just to hear what God wants to say to us and, and so that's this Thursday 7.30 to 9 o'clock we'll be in here uh, not next door, we'll be in here. And uh, let me encourage you to come along. We've got our cake sale on Saturday for the motor neuron disease. We're trying to raise some money for the motor neuron disease charity. And that is 10 till 2. Let me encourage you to come along, buy a cake, have a, have a drink of tea or coffee or, or whatever there is. And uh, come and spend some time together between uh, 2 and 4 on Saturday. If you're making a cake, and I know there's some ladies and men that have said they're going to make cakes, uh, if you could have them here before uh, for 9.15, that'd be great. So we could cut them up and display them and get them ready. Uh, so that, that's fantastic. That's that. <sighs> Go on, any time you want to come. Okay, no. 10 till 2. Right. I don't know why I've got 4 o'clock in my head today, but it's, it's there, isn't it? Hey, never mind. But forget what I say, except for this moment. 10 till 2. Okay. And don't forget to, uh, um, to email uh, messages of uh, whatever you want to say about uh, uh, Peter. Uh, about just fill this life book with maybe your memories, those things where, where Peter's life has touched you. Um, and, you know, all of, all of our lives touch people. And, and Peter's life has touched hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And, uh, and we just take the opportunity to, to put this life book together. I'll leave this here again. If you want to come and just take a photo of it, there's the link to be able to do that. Uh, please come and do that. Now then, men, we are having another men's evening on June the 26th, 7.30. So Wednesday night. And uh, let, me, let me encourage you to come along. We've got a visiting preacher, uh, preacher, speaker. Uh, he's a minister here in Leicester, uh, but he's also a biker. And uh, he's going to come and share his testimony. And um, uh, Richard knows him, and I'm meeting up with him with Richard on Wednesday. We're going to have a chat. Uh, but uh, let me encourage you to come along. He's got a great story about what God has done in his life, how God's transformed his life. You know, and how he, he has a ministry to, to men and women who are bikers. Uh, as well so uh, that'd be great won't it so that's on the 26th and we are going Italian this time okay none of that none of that curry okay I love curry oh. I know I know this they said they noticed because we have more curry nights than anything else but we're going Italian this time okay and uh, who knows what what will turn up for Italian um, but uh, that's on, on Wednesday the 26th now just, just it, time is going but I, I've got two people I want to pray for specifically this morning uh, Rincey, where's Rincey? come on Rincey and I understand there's somebody, one of our students that is going back to their country, are they going if that's you, do you mind coming forward? Are you here? Are you here? No? Oh, okay. Rincey, um, you look beautiful. Yeah? All two of you. Okay. And um, I don't know. Let's think, Rincey, when would it be? Maybe 18 months ago? Two years? One year. One year ago, is it? Yeah. 
One year ago, uh, I got an email from somebody in India saying, I'm coming to Leicester to study, uh, and I'm just reaching out, could I come to your church? So I responded to the email, and sure enough, Rinsey came, didn't you, darling? Yeah? And uh, she wanted to come and see who this strange person was. And uh, she found him to be strange, didn't you? No. <laughs> and uh, and then, uh, then her husband came across and joined her. She's studying uh, nursing here. She did nursing in India, but she's got a, a sort of a transitional thing she's got to do here. And so she's studying nursing. And, um, and I think, you're, you're, are you on a, what ward are you on? I work as a nurse in Leicester Royal Infirmary. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And what, what, what ward? It's Hampton Suite, Ward 37. It's basically dementia, delirious patients, oh. a medical ward. Okay, well done. But she, as you can see, is expecting a child. Okay. I, I am as well. Okay, just in case. It... Okay. I just wish I'd get birth. That's the only thing. Okay. Um, but she's going home on the 8th of June, and this is the last Sunday she's with us. And, uh, and she's going home to India to have the baby, and we know it's a little girl, and she's got a name, hasn't she? Yeah, Hazel. Hazel. Okay. And hubby is staying here, so we're going to look after him, aren't we? Um, uh, take care of him while you're away, and he's going to join you later. And, uh, and Rinsey says, I am looking forward to bringing Hazel back to see the church, and all of us, and then we're going to have a, uh, a baby shower for her. Uh, so that we can help them all out with, with clothes and nappies and, and you name it. Babies, babies take a lot of looking after, you know. Yeah, we've had to. Ali did a great job. Uh, <laughs> but we're going to pray for her this morning, okay. Lord, we thank you for Rinsey. Lord, we, we thank you, Lord God, that um, Lord, you brought us together. You brought her to our family here. Lord, and we are just uh, asking, Lord God, Lord, that you would bless her. We thank you, Lord God, for this uh, child, Hazel. Lord, that is, is just growing and developing in mum's tummy. And Lord, we just pray, Lord, for Hazel. Lord, uh, just bless this child. Pray for a safe delivery, Lord. Pray, God. Lord, for traveling mercies. Lord, that as she travels back to India, Lord, you go with her, go before her. Lord God, protect her and guard her and just be with her. Lord, in the time that she has before this birth, we pray, Lord God, it will be a blessed time with her family. Lord, just bless her, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you. We love you. I love you too. Uh, Thank go. You. Bless you, darling. Amen. So, if you are here for the first time and you've got children and you wonder what you're going to do with them, well, now's your opportunity for them to go to their own meeting. Nought to four is our sparklers, and uh, five to ten is our um, kingdom kids, and 11 to uh, 16 thereabouts is Acts 29. So, uh, after three, uh, one... Two, three, go. See you guys. Have a great time. Down. Good morning, good people. Oh dear. You know what? Satan, do one. Turn this off, please.
Got it. There we are. There we are. There we are. There we are. Good morning, church. I know Etienne has made you say good morning already, so I won't make you do that again. But I do want to say uh, a big hello to our online family. Uh, Sam, if you're watching, we love you. I know you've had a really, really tough week. Uh, you and your family. Obviously, what impacts upon you impacts upon the family. We love you. I, I'm not even going to say I can, I can imagine what that's like because I can't. But we love you. God loves you. And I'm still believing and declaring in the name of Jesus that your healing, your breakthrough and your healing is coming. But like Peter, in the midst of your suffering, your witness and your testimony is building the kingdom. So don't despair. God bless you. God bless you. And I want to say to my church family, I love you. I really do. I thank you for your love and your support to me and my family over all this time. I really do. I, I, I have to say that. I have to acknowledge this is my church family and I love being here. I love worshipping with you, serving with you. And uh, on occasions like today, uh, thank you, Pastor Dave, for the opportunity to, to share God's word. Let me pray. Father God, Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, I need your help today, please. I praise your name, Lord, for your word. I praise your name for this new day, for salvation, for all of the blessings that we have, Lord, your protection, your peace, your power. Lord, we thank you. I thank you for all of that. But right now, Holy Spirit, please have your way. You've given me a word. I pray that you help me to deliver it faithfully, truthfully, as you want, Lord. As these people need to hear, so let me speak. Open our hearts, our minds, our ears, Lord, to you and all that you have to say. Please help me, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. So, we know that God is love. God is love and God loves. And that is just, uh, it's, it's, it's almost a cliche. We hear it so often that it's, it's, it's almost easy to let that just go over your head. God is love. But he also loves so powerfully. But I'm going to do a 180 on that and go completely the opposite way to what God hates. My title today is What God Hates. And we're going to be talking about what God hates and what God cannot do. <gasps> There's something God cannot, because we always say God can do anything. Actually, there are some things that our almighty Father God cannot do, but all will be revealed. Um, I've, I'm going to ask you for our main uh, uh, Bible reading, if, if you're able to, please, to stand for the reading of the word. And the reading this morning is taken from Proverbs chapter 16. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 to 19. Here we go. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, Hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a man who stirs up dissension among brothers. Please be seated. It says there are six things the Lord hates, actually seven that are detestable. That's a very strong word. Seven that are detestable to him. So let's go through them very quickly. <clears throat> Excuse me. Haughty eyes, the King James says haughty eyes, or a proud look. A proud look. We've all seen that, haven't we, with someone who... They're looking down their nose at you. Or they're looking like, you know, <clears throat> you've, they've, you've just, uh, like you're something on the bottom of their shoe that they're scraping off. They walk like that, don't they? God hates it. That's the first one. <clears throat> Excuse me. A lying tongue. We'll talk more about that later. Hands that shed innocent blood. There is much of that today in the world. Hands that shed innocent blood. God hates it when you take advantage of and kill innocent people. A heart that devises wicked schemes. That's the fourth. Five, feet that are quick to rush into evil. 
You know, those people. I'm sure if you ever worked with anyone, you know, something happens and they're so quick to want to go and tell somebody else about Have you heard what's happened? Six, a false witness who pours out lies. And seven, a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Stirs up dissension among brothers. If you've ever worked in a factory setting, or it doesn't have to be a factory, a place where there are lots of people working together, it's not long before there's someone who, in the midst, who longs to just go around and make trouble, and they'll tell this group this, and they'll tell that group that, and then just sit back and watch as the fireworks kick off. God hates that. But interestingly, of those seven things, one of them is repeated. And that's where I want to focus today. And it's lying. Lying. Now, interestingly, just through uh, that list, as I was um, looking through this passage of Scripture again, I noticed, actually, that of those seven things, there are five significant body parts. Five significant body parts. This is just a little add-on. Eyes, a proud look, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, and feet that are quick to rush into evil. Which reminds me of Romans 12.1, where God tells us, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable. So it's important for us to be mindful of our whole body, because these seven things that God hates, that's a very strong word. I started off saying God is love. And we know that. And we like to say, you know, God loves you and stuff. But let us, let us not overlook what God hates. Hate is a very strong word. A very strong word. So when the Bible uses it, when the Bible says that God finds these things detestable, we need to take notes. Do we need to change mic here? Yo. Okay, is that better? There we are, you can still hear me. Satan, do one! In the name of Jesus, regardless of this stuff, God's word is going to be preached, amen? Amen. So, God detests lying. God detests lying. Proverbs 12, verse 22, please. My favorite book of the Bible is Proverbs. The Lord detests lying lips but he delights in men who are truthful. We'll come back to that. But there it is, in a nutshell. God hates lying, but he delights in men and women who are truthful. So firstly, lying, in any form, is bad news. We'll, we'll look more about why that is, why God hates lying so much. We'll look at that later. But why do we lie? There are many reasons why we as human beings lie. And, and I was thinking of a way that I could introduce this topic, and in the end I didn't go with it. But it would have involved all of us starting out with our hands up and asking a series of questions. And at the point that that applies to you, you know, you put your hand down. But if I were to ask the question, or even just imply, if there's anybody here who has never, ever told a lie in their life, all hands would be down. Every single one of us at some point in our life has lied. Why do we do it? There are many reasons why people lie, but we can basically put it under, into two categories. One, to gain an advantage or a reward. That's why people lie. Or two, the other end of that scale, is to avoid a negative consequence. Yeah, you know, often uh, I, I was... Um, one of the jobs I had, TV jobs, many years ago, we had a, a police advisor... And this police advisor was saying that it, it's a sad fact of life that every single day of a police officer's working life, they are dealing with people who are lying to them. In fact, it's such now that the, uh, the police officer's default is, I'm going to assume you're lying until I have proof otherwise that you're telling me the truth. They have the ABC of policing, accept nothing, believe no one, and check everything. So we lie to avoid unpleasant consequences or to gain an advantage, as I said. So what sort of lies? What sort of lies do we engage in? I mean, all lies are bad, but, you know, we, we as human beings, we tend to kind of put them into different categories. The classic one is a white lie. You know, it's not really a lie, is it? Actually, it is. 
you know, it's kind of, we just kind of distort the truth a bit or bend it, but it's not really that serious and nothing really serious comes of it, does it? You know, a little white lie. But actually a lie is a lie. And why do we, why do we tell white lies? Sometimes it's often to spare people's feelings, isn't it? I don't want to tell them the truth because that's going to hurt them. Or it may, I then may have to deal with, you know, the, the, telling them the truth, I have to deal with the whole thing. So it's easy just to tell them a little white lie. It's not good. It's not good. It's not good. It's not good. In the name of Jesus, and I'll tell you for why. I'll tell you for why a white lie is not good. A lie is a lie. And that's the very sort of reason, maybe, why God has brought this word up today. Because we need to hear, the Bible has just said, God hates lying. It's detestable. Of the seven things, two of them were lying. Two of them were lying. How important is that in a group of seven things? Two of them are lying. So does that not suggest that we need to wake up and hear what God has to say about lying? A lie is a lie. And regardless of your motive, regardless of the reason as to why you make that white lie, it's still wrong. It's still wrong. Then there's a downright lie, an out-and-out lie, where people make things up purely for the purpose of deceiving somebody else. And I've met people who do that. Then there's a distortion of the truth. So we're, kind, we're telling the truth, you know, uh, but we miss a little bit out. That is a lie. In the name of Jesus, be still. I'll tell you why it's a lie. Because if you take a sentence of truth and either add or take away in any capacity, it is no longer the truth. And therefore, it's a lie. It's a lie. It is a lie. And then there's withholding the truth. Now, what does that mean? This one may be slightly different, but how often have you been in a situation where, um, where somebody is perpetrating something that's not quite accurate, but you know the truth and you don't speak it? Now, you may well think, well, that's, 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 that's not lying. But in the Bible elsewhere, it says, if you know to do good and don't do it, that's a sin. So where the truth is being withheld or distorted and you yourself in that situation know the truth, I, there was a, an example to me personally where many, many, many years ago, one of the earliest jobs I had long before I became an actor, in fact, long before I, I was a nurse, so we're talking way back, early 80s, and I had a job and it was in an office, uh, a, a clerical job. And I became aware of some people who were talking about somebody else. And the stuff that they were saying was not only not true, but it, it really wasn't very nice. And I'm ashamed to say that even though I knew the truth at the time, in that moment, I didn't say anything. And to this day, it haunts me. Now, I've confessed it, but what that has done is it's made me more determined that if I ever were to be in that situation again, I'm going to speak up and speak the truth. Okay? So, not now. Not now, good lady. Not now. You can ask me at the end. Uh, okay, but right now, in the name of Jesus, I have been, God's asked me to say this. We can talk about it later on. And you're not arguing with me. Whatever you have to say, this is the standard. This is the standard. I'm not going to get distracted anymore. But that's the very reason why this word has come up today. In the name of Jesus, I declare God's truth. The problem with the world today is they don't want to hear the truth. In the book of Timothy, it talks about the fact that now men want to have messages that please their itching ears. If it's popular, if it's popular, that's what people want to accept. I said to you the last time I spoke on May the 12th, uh, a statement by a gentleman called, I think, William Penn. He said, right is right, even if everyone is against it, 
And wrong is wrong, even if everyone is for it. And so it's that same spirit of boldness that I declare God's truth today. So what are the consequences of lying? Death. Now that may sound heavy, but that's what can come of lying. Let me tell you, nothing good ever comes from lying. Death. The destruction of trust, integrity, your reputation. It can take a lifetime to build up a reputation, to build up your reputation. And in one moment, folly, lying, stupidity, it's destroyed. And I don't know if you've ever experienced with someone where you have a relationship with them and there's a degree of trust that's been built up in that relationship. And then... They let you down. Now, we all make mistakes. We all make mistakes. But if that person has lied to you, one, if they've lied to you, and two, if as a result of that lie, you somehow, it's put you in a lesser position, you've suffered as a result of that, then from that time on, even though the relationship may be restored, do you ever trust them quite the same way again? You don't. So we're talking about the consequences of lying. Death, destruction, it's never any good. It's never any good, ever. I won't turn to the scripture, but some of you, most of you, may be aware in uh, the book of Acts, the story of Ananias and Sapphira, a husband and wife. The early church, Acts chapter 5, they had a property, and they sold it. And they, between them... Decide, so, sorry, rewind. So the early church and the members of that early church are selling their possessions and bringing all of the proceeds to the disciples. So they're collecting the money and all the possessions so that they can distribute to, to whoever needs it accordingly. Okay? So Ananias and Sapphira, part of that church, they have a property, they sell it, and they, between them, agree to keep back part of the money So they only brought a a portion of the money before the disciples. And Peter challenged them and said, is is this all of the money that that you've brought? Yep, that's what we got. Long story short, Ananias, the husband, dropped dead. Three hours later, his wife comes in. She wasn't there at the time. She comes in. Peter asks her, is this all of the money that you received? Yes, that's all the money you received. Why have you lied? Why have you lied? Before the Holy Spirit. In fact, you've not just lied before men, you've lied before God. And the very men who've just buried your husband are coming now to, oh, she dropped dead. Now, as we will see, in fact, like I said, there isn't time, but trust me, Acts chapter 5, verse 1 to 11. Here's your homework. Read that for yourself. When Peter rebukes them, he doesn't rebuke them for withholding the money. Read it for yourself. He rebukes them because they lied. They, Ananias, he said, why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? And the wife, Sapphira, you've not just lied before men, you've lied before God. The issue of withholding the money wasn't even raised. That's why lying is serious. Modern day examples for us now. Some of you may know there was, uh, there's an American ex Uh, cyclist athlete Lance Armstrong who won seven Tour de France's amongst many other accolades but if I say to you the name Lance Armstrong if you know the name Lance Armstrong what's the first thing that comes to your mind cheating for all of his achievements what he is now known for is cheating and here's the terrible thing so okay he took drugs and uh, that's he was on drugs when he won all of those things okay But here's the thing, he went, and then as the rumours started to surface and people saying he's taking drugs, he went on a campaign to utterly destroy the people who were bringing the truth against him. And in the end, here's the thing, in the end, the truth came out and he admitted, I think it was Oprah, did you take drugs to enhance your performance all that time? Yes, I did. And yet he'd gone on a, a personal vendetta 
to personally sue and vind, uh, 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 vilify those who came against him. And all of his success was built on a lie. So what happened? Everything that he achieved has been wiped clean. The Tour de France, the Olympic medals, all of that completely lost. Not because he took drugs. Because he lied. Because he lied. Right now, it's still not finished yet. The post office scandal. We all are aware of this right now. And you know what's so bad about the post It gets me going. I'm sure it does you. So if you don't know about it, okay, uh, the post office, with all the sub-postmasters, had an issue. They got a new IT system. They got a new IT system that didn't work properly. And so lots of people ended up being falsely accused of taking money that they didn't. That they didn't. Now, here's the real tragedy of that situation, is that the bosses knew. They knew it wasn't working properly, and yet they continued. They denied that it wasn't working properly, and they continued. And for those of you that don't believe that lying causes death, people lost their lives in that tragedy based upon a lie. People are dead because people lied and maintained and held the lie. So lying is a very, very serious business. And of course, you know, we're all coming up to an election and there are politicians. You know, you say politicians, you know, a politician and the truth, that's an oxymoron, isn't it? You know, you laugh, that's a laughter of recognition. We laugh about it. But actually, we're coming up now to an election, our own election, where we have to listen to MPs. You know the drill. We listen to MPs, and when you listen to them, you're thinking, mm, are you just saying that? Are you telling me what I want to hear? You know, or you may say that now, but then the moment you get voted in, you, com uh, you completely forget that promise that you made, or you're actually lying to me just to get me to vote for you. Deary me. If Donald Trump, just, I'm going to go off on a slight tangent, but if Donald Trump becomes the president of the United States of America again, there is something seriously wrong with this world. The man's a convicted felon. And what's it based on? A lie. A lie. He did something. Someone accused him of it because they found it out. He said, no, 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 that's not true. And even though he's been convicted, a full jury, 34 counts, guilty on every single one of them. No, 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 that's not true. Folks, lying, whether little white lies or massive corporate whoppers, is a serious business. Let I remind you, I'll go back to where we started. They are detestable to the Lord. And we're all guilty. We've all been guilty of telling lies. God is good. God is gracious. The blood of his son Jesus Christ forgives us when we confess our sins. But make no mistake, from this point on, we all know, we're all now singing from the same hymn sheet that lying is detestable to God. It has serious consequences. Why is that? Why is God so against lying? Because it goes against him and every single thing that he is. It's from the devil. John 8:44. So Jesus is talking to the Pharisees who are arguing about, you know, about various things, challenging him as they always did, challenging the things that he's saying. And he says to them, this is Jesus to the Pharisees, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. Why? For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So that's where lies originate. So if anybody here wants to tell me that lying's okay, that's where it's from. And that it was a lie that led to the downfall of mankind in the Garden of Eden. Did God really say? Did, did he? And we believed it. I say we because you put any of us in that garden. And would we really be able to resist the enemy? Because he didn't say, God said, don't eat that. Go and eat that. Go and eat that fruit. Go on. He came alongside. Did, did, did he really say that? Really? He is the father of lies. 
So lying and anything connected with it comes from the devil. And in case you hadn't noticed, God and the devil are not bosom buddies. So if anyone here wants to tell me that lying is, is okay in any form or white lies are not really lying, that's where I'll point you to. Because that's how the enemy wants to deceive us. He deceived Adam and Eve. He deceived them. We need to have our eyes open. So that little white lie that we tell somebody is not right. Because ultimately it's sin. And sin, when it comes forth, leads to death. Why is God so against lying? Because the devil is the father of lies. And God is the exact opposite of that. John 14, 6. Jesus himself is speaking. It's a well-known verse. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the truth. And I began when I opened, I said, you know, we're going to talk about things that God cannot do. What do you mean, Del? God can do anything. Hebrews 6.18 God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. God cannot lie. He cannot lie. And therefore, any, and he is the truth. Jesus is the truth. So when you bring anything to God, if it's not consistent with his truth, he sees right through it in an instant. God cannot lie. Oh, Lord, I wish that for all of us. Why don't we tell the truth? Because sometimes it will get us into trouble. And we would rather face the wrath of God at a later point than deal with the, con the immediate consequences of telling the truth in that moment. Do you know, Jesus always told the truth. Always told the truth. And it got him into a lot of trouble with these miserable people who wanted to challenge him. So make no mistake, when you decide to tell the truth, and the Bible is also very clear, it says speak the truth in love. So I'm not talking about being rude or belligerent or nailing people down with the truth. That's not God's way. But it is about speaking the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. So that's why he's so against it. He can't do that himself. He cannot do that. So what's our response? We've looked at what lying is. We've looked at what the consequences are. It's never, ever good. Death, destruction, loss, reputation, our standing, our status, our relationships. And why is God so against it? Because it's the complete antithesis to all that God is. God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. So what's our response to this that we're hearing? And I'm sure, I, it's a fair guess, I, 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 I imagine, I assume that each and every one of us is resolving right now, yeah, I'm going to tell the truth. I'm going to be really honest from this point on. That's a good thing. You'll only do that and maintain it by the power of the Holy Spirit, I hasten to add. But what's our response? To be accepted by God, we can only truly worship God from a place of truth. Pastor Dave alluded to this verse um, uh, already earlier today. So John 4, verse 23 and 24. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And here's a bonus for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. Verse 24 God is spirit, and his worshippers must, not might, or when you feel like it, they must worship in spirit and in truth. Must worship in spirit and in truth. And if you just go back to 23, please, Ali. The were true worshippers, true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. Grab hold of that. What does that mean? It means if you serve God in truth, in spirit and truth, he's not just pleased, 
He comes looking for you. He, it says it there. They are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks, looks out, looks for. If that's not a great motivation or incentive to speak the truth, to worship in spirit and truth, I don't know what else is. And if we can go back very quickly, Ali, to uh, Proverbs 12, uh, 22. It says, God hates a lying tongue, but he delights in people who are truthful. That's, that's, that's the one, thank you. Delights in people who are truthful. So the question you have to ask yourself when, not if, the next time you're in a, di- a dilemma of whether to tell the truth or not, ask yourself this. What's my main motivation here? What's the most important thing here? Is it to please God or is it to please men or is it to save myself? He delights in people who are truthful. Now, unfortunately, there are consequences to telling the truth sometimes for you and or others. You know, here's another one, another classic one. So again, you're working with a a group of people and the company lie, as it were. I I, I was working somewhere one time and um, with a group of people and I joined them and their way of working was, let's say, less than honourable. And I'm not coming out to be a goody two-shoes at all. But having joined them, the group uh, ethos, if you like, was... This is a bit of a slightly shady way of doing it, but we're all doing that. And that's, you know, you're joining us now. We're letting you know this is how it works. My dilemma was, well, I know that's not right. But what do I then do against this whole group of people that I'm the new boy just started working with? Based upon my experience many years earlier, when I didn't speak up when I should have done, I did the right thing. It wasn't pleasant But I stand here now as one who uh, has a clear conscience that in that moment I did the right thing. And do you know what they said to me? You're making us look bad. You're telling the truth. You're making us all look bad. What are you doing? Uh, Excuse me. Your way of working is less than honourable. And yet when I come here and tell the truth, I'm making you look bad. So, go back to our response. What's our response to God? That's our response to God. Tell the truth. Because God seeks those who tell the truth. He delights in people who are truthful. And as Peter said, I think it was Peter, Peter said, we ought to obey God rather than men. So it doesn't matter how popular this is over here, where everyone's telling, well, it's not really a lie. No, it's not a lie. It's just, it's just... There's a, oh my goodness, an American politician, can't remember the name and it doesn't matter. And it's a she, and she, she is famed for euphemizing the biggest lie into what sounds like the truth. No, I didn't tell a lie, I just didn't tell the truth. And Pete, do you know what's even funnier? People believe it. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll accept that. Clever words, clever words. But if you've got the Holy Spirit working in you, because God hates lying, because it's impossible for God to lie, and the devil is the father of all lies, if the Holy Spirit's alive and at work in you, you'll see through that in an instant. And you may not even recognize it as a lie, but there'll be something in your spirit that says, this doesn't sound right to me. Follow the Spirit. So that's our response to God. Basically, tell the truth. Tell the truth. And our responsibility to each other, Ephesians 4, 21 to 25, please. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires. Cross-reference there again, Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. So we're putting off the old. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, the old has gone, the new has come. To be made new in the attitude of your minds. Cross-reference, Romans 12, 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 
and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And here's the big one. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. For we are all members of one body. And I go right back to the six, no, seven things that God finds detestable. How many body parts were in that? So we're all one body, different parts, different bits with different functions, but we are all the same body. Pastor Dave always says, as in the natural, so in the spiritual. So as in the natural, if your body starts working against itself, you're in trouble. There are many autoimmune disorders where the body, for some reason, starts working against itself. It's not good. It's not good. Or if something that's not good from outside is allowed inside the body, you eat something bad. It's not long before (laughs) your body's telling you, hello, there's something not right here. You best get yourself to a private room quick. Because if you don't, I'm going to make you. And what happens? What happens when we've got something bad inside us? I'm not going to be graphic here. We'll, we'll, We'll go the more polite way. If you've just eaten something bad, you feel sick and then you're... Because that's the body's way of getting it out. Get it out. So if we've got someone from outside coming to our church that's causing dissension within the community, get them out. If they don't align with the body. So we need to be truthful with each other. Why? Because our old nature, we need to put that behind us. And it's a daily struggle. It's a daily battle. But we're moving forward in truth. Here's the thing, as my dad always used to say to me, Delroy, tell the truth. Because if you tell the truth, you never then have to go back and think about what it was that you said. It will always be the same. Police officers, when they're interviewing people, have, it's not that clever now because everybody knows about it, but they have a technique where they'll ask you a question and then they'll ask you a series of other questions, and then they'll just go back and say, oh, sorry, you just you said, when I asked you about uh, what day it was that you, you, you were walking, what did, what, did, what did you say? You said it was Tuesday, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, I think it was, ah, bingo, got you, because the first time you said it was a Monday. They cross-reference you all the time. So if you tell the truth... You don't have to worry about that technique because if you told the truth the first time, when they come back, and actually um, police will say that one of the indications that that someone is telling the truth or they've got a gang of people and they'll split you up and interview you separately. They'll interview you all, ask you all the same questions and it's only when they get consistent answers that they then believe they're they're getting near to where the truth is. This is important, folks. It's important. And finally, as I close, for each and every one of us, at some point in our lives, we've told a whopper. Whether it's a big one or a little one, we've all lied. And it's, this is not about uh, a feeling condemned. Hear me, hear me, hear me. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from every single sin when we confess it. Okay, so it's not about uh, condemning. It's not about feeling guilty. It's not about feeling beaten down. This is the way for us to receive forgiveness, but we've got to confess it. In fact, before confessing it, we need to recognize it in the first place. So the little white lies, the little things that you tell that either aren't completely true or you've said it because, you know, you want to make a point with somebody. You know, how many times when you, 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 you hear someone telling a story, there's somebody very close in my family who always does this. I'm with him at a particular event particular conversation I'm with him I was there but when I hear him recounting it to somebody else suddenly it's magnified 50 times things were twice as big twice as long twice as loud and I said to him one time I said actually that's not strictly yes it was I was there I was there I said no that's that's not how it goes that element of exaggeration And it might be great for your storytelling and it might be great for your kudos. But ultimately, if you're exaggerating, if you've added or embellished, it becomes a lie. The truth might be in there somewhere, but it's a lie. So here as I close, what's our response right now to God? 
We need to repent. We need to repent of lying. Lies that, we've, we, that, that, we, we, that we know we've made. And untruths that maybe we're not aware of, like any sin, to be honest. This is the same, you know, unconfessed sin in any area of our life that we're not aware of. That's what the blood of Jesus does. So it's not about being condemned. But if you're feeling convicted right now, this is your answer. This is your answer. Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And as I close, here's a thing to remember. Ananias and Sapphira, they didn't die because they withheld part of the money. They died because they lied. So whatever it is that you've done, in fact, the, the, the examples I read at the post office and, and, and Trump and, you know, Dick, Tricky Dicky Nixon, those of you that are old enough to remember Watergate, all of those things, the real true crime, the reason why they stick in our minds and our memories is not because of the crime that they did. It's because they lied about it and subsequently built a massive cover-up. So right now, in the name of Jesus, if this convicts you, and it's not my words, again, as always, I make no apologies when God lays a word on my heart, Lord, is this what you want me to say? We just need to confess it. And from that moment, go and sin no more, as Jesus says, because the consequences are too awful to consider. As I said, nothing good ever comes from lying. And even though nobody else may know that you're not telling the truth, whichever, whichever way you want to dress it up, uh, whether you don't tell the truth or whether you tell a lie, it's still not in accordance with God and what he wants. And that's what he wants to get to the heart of. Amen? Amen. Truth is truth, isn't it? And the word of God says that truth sets us free. And God's word is there to set us free. Not to bind us, okay, but to bring freedom into our lives. It was for freedom that Christ came to set us free. Not to bind us up. And, and you know, sometimes, a lot of the times, sometimes, I use sometimes. People say this, the devil made me do it. I want to say that uh, there's a good old-fashioned Derbyshire word. It's called poppycock. Yeah? Poppycock. It means rubbish. Right? Basically. Poppycock. Strange word, isn't it? The devil doesn't make us do stuff. Yeah? He doesn't, have that, he doesn't have that power over our lives. But what he has done from, from the time of the fall, he has sown in the sin into our nature. And we have the choice what to do. And when it comes to truth or telling a lie, we have the choice. The devil doesn't make us do it. And yet so often we want to give the devil this, this permission, this weight. I want to say that he doesn't have it. But take responsibility yourself and say, Lord, yeah, I did it. Forgive me. You know, in Isaiah 53, verse 6, it's six it says this. All us, all of us, and I'm reading from the Amplified Version. All of us like sheep have gone astray. We've gone the wrong way. We have turned each one of us to his own way. That's what I'm saying. We've done it because that sinful nature is within us. But the Lord has caused the wickedness of us all, our sin, our injustice, our wrongdoing, to fall on him instead of us. You see, Jesus Christ is the answer for each and every one of us. And you might be in there for the first time and you might have heard that message, the message that's come through with such passion. 
but it's truth. And if you know that you are prone, and I say prone, that's a big word, to not telling the truth, then I, then I want you to consider this. Not for me, but I want, you to, I want you to go to God, the Holy Spirit, and say, Lord, come and see if there's something in me that needs to be put right, that I need to lay down at the foot of the cross and allow Jesus to deal with. You see, Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but by through him that the world might be saved. Yeah. And God wants to set us free from these things in our lives. You know, sin entered into the world through one man and through one man, the God-man, Jesus Christ, he paid the price for our sin. And Psalm 23 says this, if we look at the analogy of sheep, all we like sheep have gone astray, then let's follow the good shepherd, shall we? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down beside green pastures. He leads me, he restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My enemies, you have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, it's not come to condemn, but it's come to set us free. Lord, the devil would bind us and hold us back, but Lord, you have come to break every chain in our lives. Lord, you have broken the chains that bind us. Hallelujah. And you have set us free in Christ Jesus. Amen. Lord, and we proclaim that freedom in Jesus' name over our lives. Amen. 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 Let's stand together. We're going to worship God in song. Uh, often, thanks are here. Thank you for your giving. And uh, thank you for your faithful giving, your tithes and offerings.
Thank you for this morning. Thank you for your presence here. Lord, <laughs> you cannot lie. Lord, and maybe the question, when given that choice, we should ask ourselves, what would God do? What would God do? <coughs> Lord, help us to be children of the living God. Help us to be Christ-like in our lives. Lord, why? We want to bring honor and glory to your name. Yes. Amen. Lord, we want to lift up you. Lord, we want to see, let the world see the truth living in us and through us to the world around us. Lord, come by your Holy Spirit. Minister to each person here this morning. Lord God, you have come to bring liberty to the captive, to bring sight to the blind, to bind up the brokenhearted. Lord, to set the captive free, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Lord God, help us to be your disciples. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Please stay and have a drink. Anybody here for the first time this morning? Are you here for the first time? We'd like to give you just something right now. If you don't mind doing that, Ben, just keep your hand up. Give us a wave. Okay, we just want to give you a welcome pack. Um, if you want to stay and have a drink through this door, teas, coffees, donuts, cakes, biscuits, yeah, <laughs> feed your body. You've had your soul fed. Go and feed your body. And uh, bless you. Have a great week. Praise God. Don't forget the cake sale on Saturday.